Good morning. I'm not right sure we're still going. Um, my name is Bruce Green. I'm a volunteer here at the museum. Uh, and I was a school teacher for a number of years. Um, and I'm going to talk about propaganda during World War II today. And, and uh, a lot of people say I spread a lot of propaganda, but they generally don't use that term for it. Uh, so bear with me. I am going to try to show you a few clips of things uh, as we go. I'm not the most tech savvy guy in the world, but I did learn how to embed a video into a PowerPoint program while doing this. So I'm making progress. Uh, so I've got to turn this on. See if that's that. What is propaganda? Well, it is biased information. What's the purpose of it? It's to shape your behavior and your opinions about things. Okay, that it says that there. Uh, how does propaganda work? Well, there's a lot of things involved in propaganda. It can be uh, put forth in a number of different ways. You can see examples up here. Uh, you know, it can be some of these, uh, it could be all of these, it could be one of these, but a lot of times it involves half truths, lies. Uh, sometimes it's the truth. Uh, sometimes it just omits certain information, uh, keep you from knowing certain things. Uh, sometimes it'll simplify a, a more complex issue. Sometimes it plays on your emotions. Uh, sometimes it attacks others. We see a lot of politicians use that method. Uh, sometimes it, it targets a specific audience. So there's a lot of ways propaganda works. And, Governments have become, and, and militaries and, and so on throughout history, have become pretty good at learning how to use these things. Uh, propaganda has been around for a long time. The origin of the word comes from the congregation of propagating the faith. And it was from uh, a group of Catholic cardinals established uh, this congregation in 1622 to spread or to supervise the spread of missions around the world. Uh, but the word propaganda came from this, and this was during the Counter-Reformation period. Uh, but a lot of people have used it. King Khan used propaganda. He used to send writers into a city before he attacked it and, and for them to spread the rumors about how large his army was and, and what danger these people were in. And a lot of times, people would hightail it out of the city before they got there. And they didn't have to fight as hard. Well, that's, that's propaganda. Um, the Roman Empire used it in a lot of different ways. Uh, coins, you know, coins, putting the dictator's heads on coins. Uh, you ever heard of breads and circuses from the Roman Empire? They would, they, they build all these big arenas and, and theaters and, and racetracks. And they would pass out food. It was called the breads and circuses. Feed them and entertain them, and they forget about their miseries. That was propaganda. Uh, they used oratory and literature and poetry and a lot of different things in propaganda. Uh, the uh, Reformation, both Catholics and the Protestants, used propaganda. And you know, this is about the time the printing press is coming around. So propaganda expands to written materials. But it's been used throughout history by, by governments, politicians, religions, industries to promote, persuade, attack, uh, to get their message across the way they want you to receive it. Uh, I'm going to skip that one because there's a lot of information that we don't have time to go over. Methods of propaganda have changed throughout history. You know, we talked about some early ways that propaganda was, was uh, displayed. Well, here's some, some more recent, but not the most recent. You know, uh, theater, plays, newspapers, leaflets, books, posters, and then comes radio and, and movies. They become a great tool for spreading propaganda. Today, if you own I put my phone away on also to make sure I didn't, it didn't go off or anything. But if you're carrying a smartphone, you're carrying propaganda with you all the time. Because everything we look at on there anymore is, is propaganda. 
uh, your computer, your television. We have smart televisions now. Uh, you see people, all these kids all the time with the earbuds in, and they've got something playing in their ears all the time. You know, with propaganda in our face constantly anymore. Now, the interesting thing, I, I took a course on propaganda last year from the National World War II Museum. And I've heard of algorithms, but I didn't know anything about them. I still am no expert on algorithms. But I learned more about how come I see all these things on my computer. <laughs> because they've got programs that are trained to send you more of what you look at. And the more you look at it, the more extreme it becomes. So people are getting extreme views of things and they don't even realize it because of the things they, they continue to look at. Now I learned this, you can train those algorithms, but we don't, that's a whole different program. Uh, but you can train them by looking at the opposite things. And then all of a sudden that extremism comes down. Interesting. But so many people today are seeing extreme things because these algorithms keep sending it to you. Uh, you know, just maybe that's, like I said, I'm no expert on that, and I don't know how it all works, but I know it's true because I see it on my own stuff. And I'm sure you do too. All right, we're going to start talking by talking about propaganda with the Axis nations, and we're going to talk specifically about Italy and Germany. Uh, Italy, Benito Mussolini uh, wrote the political and social uh, doctrine of fascism. And he said, for fascism, the state is absolute. Individuals and groups relative. Individuals and groups are admissible insofar as they come within the state. So the state comes first. And he used a lot of different methods of propaganda to get that message to people. Now, you're going to see a lot of similarities between these nations and the methods of propaganda that they use. Uh, and they all had somebody in charge of propaganda. They had departments. They had a, an organization within their government that that was their job. Your job is to spread propaganda. And make sure the people are supporting us and our cause. In Italy, that guy was Dino Alfieri. He was the Secretary for Press and Propaganda in Italy during World War II. And their goal was to make the Allied powers look weak against the Axis powers. Uh, and it specifically mostly targeted the United States and Britain with, those, with that propaganda. Uh, and Mussolini used a number of methods. He used film, art, uh, books, uh, photography, songs, posters, a lot of different things. He used the fasces, which was a symbol of power from the Roman Empire. He would put that symbol on a lot of things. So, you know, a lot of things we're doing is propaganda, even though people don't realize that's what it is a lot of times. So we'll look at a couple of examples of Italian propaganda. These are, these are posters. This one shows Churchill and uh, Roosevelt, and it says the blame's on them. Here's Roosevelt with rain, bank, bombs raining down on an Italian city, and it shows Roosevelt laughing. You know, and talking about his virtues. And over here's a racist propaganda poster from, from Italy. Uh, showing an African American soldier stealing the Venus de Milo. Some others. Uh, and you'll see themes of these things as we go. Working uh, industry, working for the cause. That's going to be a common theme among all these nations. Uh, this one, defend your Italian children from communist Jews and uh, Freemasons. Over here, uh, about not spreading rumors. Don't don't uh, let secrets out. Keep quiet. Another common thing we'll see. Japanese propaganda. Now uh, Japan focused a lot of their propaganda more on on uh, uh, 
self-sacrifice on, on their own nation. Heroism, martyrism, instructional me messages about how to, to take cover in case of a air raid, things like that. But they did also have propaganda that demonized the United States. Um, they were uh, telling people that uh, the United States was trying to destroy their cultural, uh, their culture and, and uh, to dominate them. Another thing though, you'll see with Japanese propaganda is they were convinced that they were racially superior to the Chinese, to the Koreans, and to other Asian people. And this example shows you that, that they were trying to uh, get the Chinese and Manchurians to uh, support Japan instead of fighting against them. You know, let's, let's be united. Here's one about increasing war production, another common theme. Luxury is our enemy, and they'll be willing to do without things during the war, another common thing you'll we'll see within nations. Uh, fire and never quit. Join the young men's military brigade. Here's a recruitment poster for pilots. Uh, you know, again, some pretty common things you see among nations uh, during World War II. A movie poster. This is from the story of tank commander Nishizumi. Nish Nishizumi. He was a, a tank commander in the, on the Chinese front. And they made this movie to portray him as this as great hero uh, to encourage others to join the military and, and to become a part of this. And then leaflets. A, a lot of countries use leaflets to drop from airplanes upon the places during the war. This is a leaflet that was dropped on the Filipinos in the Philippines, warning uh, or telling them uh, the Filipino people, you should join uh, the Japanese military rather than fighting against them and waiting to die. You know, so again, these are all methods of propaganda. Here's a couple that show uh, the United States is evil. Roosevelt in both of these uh, looks very evil, you see him here uh, as a puppeteer. Uh, so, you know, they did have their propaganda that attacked the United States. And we've got We've got examples of propaganda throughout our museum. Well, we've got one similar to this in uh, one of our pages here in the uh, World War II gallery. Uh, Japan did have an Office of Public Information that was created in 1940 in charge of propaganda, like many of the other nations. Tokyo Road. Now, Tokyo Road wasn't really a specific person. Tokyo Rose was a group of English-speaking disc jockeys, female disc jockeys, uh, on American radio. Or they would send out to, to in the South Pacific to, uh, that American soldiers could pick it up. And she, they would try to demoralize the American troops by spreading rumors. Uh, you know, she would say things like, uh, uh, your girlfriend back home is cheating on you. And, and Try to get in their head, you know, and uh, but she wasn't really an individual. However, there was an individual that was arrested and tried and uh, found guilty of treason. Her name was Tadori Yakino, and uh, later in 1956 she was paroled, and in 1977 Gerald Ford pardoned her. Uh, and I don't know all the story behind it, but the, you know the fact that she was prosecuted as the specific person when it was actually a whole group of people. So, uh, but this is her. Uh, just a. I'm just going to play a little clip. This is what she might have sounded like on the radio. Started with propaganda even before he was in charge of the government. 
1924, uh, he wrote this. He wrote this. Propaganda's task is not to make an objective study of the truth. Uh, its task is to serve our own right, always and unflinchingly. So, I mean, he came right out and said, you know, we're, we're going to lie to get our way. Uh, and then he wrote my intent in 1925. The whole thing was propaganda. You know, it was his views for, for his political ideology and views for Germany's future. And it included a lot of anti-Semitic uh, propaganda. Um, when Hitler ascended to power, he appointed Joseph Goebbels as the Reich Minister of Propaganda. He served in that role until the end of the war. Uh, Goebbels uh, controlled every part of media, including radio, movies, uh, books, posters, newspapers, magazines, uh, all of the forms that were available at the time were under the control of Joseph Goebbels. He made this statement. If you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it, and you'll even come to believe it yourself. Uh, some other things he said. Uh, arguments must therefore be proved, clear, and forcible, and appeal to emotions and instincts, not the intellect. Truth was unimportant and entirely subordinate in his tactics and in psychology. Gerber said this, think of the press as a great keyboard on which the government can play. He also said this, propaganda must facilitate the displacement of aggression by specifying the targets for hatred. And he said this, the rank and file are usually much more primitive than we imagine. Propaganda must therefore always be essentially simple and repetitious. You know, so he had a plan, and he implemented that plan, and it worked to a great extent. German propaganda focused on, again, the same thing as others, industry, youth, uh, rat head, taking care of, making sure we got enough food and war products, and, and uh, joining the military, and, and being patriotic, all these things. And they used posters and movies and newspapers and books and all the things the other nations were using. Early on, uh, well, here, here's an example. The enemy sees your lights, so blackouts, a common thing we use that propaganda in our country. Uh, build weapons for the front, again, industry, a common thing. Youth, here's three posters encouraging youth to participate in the war effort. Uh, youth serves the Fuhrer, all 10 year olds into the Hitler Youth. Waste paper collection, German students fighting uh, for their leaders and their people. Some other, here's one about women, women in the air raid protection program. Uh, victory for Europe, uh, victory for Germany is freedom for Europe, and then why we fight for our children's bread. You know, again, playing on people's emotions and their patriotism. Now, one thing that Germany did that you don't see in all of the other nations, now, now Italy did, uh, uh, some of this as well with the uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, propaganda that led to the Holocaust. Um, and it starts early on in Germany. Uh, and the propaganda included all the methods we talked about before and some more. Uh, propaganda against Jews created an atmosphere of hatred, and it created an atmosphere tolerant of violence against Jews. Uh, so, going all the way back to the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, which singled out Jewish people and who was a Jewish person, and, and Kristallnacht, and these things were allowing violence against Jewish people. Uh, Jews were often portrayed as subhuman. You know, you see it in uh, in this poster, the, uh, behind the empty tower of the Jew. And this is from a movie called The Eternal Jew, and it, and it uh, created the aspect or, or the projection to people that Jewish people were evil. But not just Jewish people were persecuted in the Holocaust. Here you see a poster from Germany that says, the hereditary ill person will cost our national community 60,000 right marks over the course of its life. Citizens, this is your money. So, 
propaganda against the disabled. And they were victims of the Holocaust as well. Um, some other things that were German propaganda during the Holocaust. This is a child's game. It's called Jews Out. A board game. This is a child's school book called The Poisonous Mushroom. And it portrays the evils of Jewish people. And it even would throw out propaganda that you can tell who a Jewish person is by the shape of their nose. And such nonsense as that. <coughs> uh, this is a poster from the Nuremberg Law that describes who a Jewish person was. And it was based on your uh, family tree. And how many grandparents were Jewish and that kind of thing. So this describes who was Jewish and who wasn't. And then there were ghettos that were created, and I'll get into that in a little more detail here. And, and uh, uh, ghettos and concentration camps. And, and propaganda played an important role in those things. Uh, again, in 1941 in Germany, Jewish people had to wear a yellow star on their clothing to identify them. It was law. Then in 42 and 43, in the other countries that Germany occupied, they had to wear the yellow star. Now, they forced you to wear this yellow star, and then they put up posters like this one that says, whoever wears this symbol is an enemy of our people. So if you put this poster up, and you make people wear this star, guess what that subjected them to? Exactly. So propaganda led the people of Germany to buy into this hatred. Uh, this is an announcement that was posted, and it's very deceiving because it's telling the Jewish people of this community, of the local ghetto, you're going to be resettled for work in another community. So they were told to gather their things and go to the train station. Instead, where were they taken? They were taken to Kelmore, which was one of the six killing centers in Poland. And then on the gates of all the concentration camps, this phrase is there, our Bachmach cry, work makes you free. That's propaganda. Even in these camps, right up to the last minute, in Auschwitz and the killing centers, they were built to look like shower rooms. They would go in and they would tell them to take off all their clothes. They had pegs on the walls to hang their clothes on. They, had, they even had a sign outside the gas chamber that was made to look like a shower room. Remember where you hang your clothes. Right up to the end, propaganda. Um, now, I told you about uh, 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 Theresa Stat. It was the ultimate propaganda stunt. The International Red Cross was going to visit you know, there was a lot of word out by 1944 about these camps and the evil things that were happening there. So they sent out, the, the Red Cross says, we want to come in and see. We want to see for ourselves. So the Germans created the Resistat, uh, or, or they did a, what they call a beautification of it. Uh, they brought in all these children, they taught them songs, they even put on play, but I actually met a lady that was in Theresa staff a few years ago who was a child and she would she performed in the play that they did there. And, and they had coffee shops and they had a garden. So when the Red Cross comes in, they're seeing this community where there's people sitting in a coffee shop. They're seeing this ch these children sing songs and, and perform a play. Uh, they, they see things are in the garden out here and, and they're raising their own gardens. So when they leave, they report back, no, they, they were treated pretty well there. Shortly after the Red Cross left, 34,000 people from that camp were sent to Auschwitz and gas. That was all for propaganda. All right, now we're going to get into Allied propaganda some more. And uh, you see all of the Allied nations flags here on these posts. You know, calling for unification for victory against the Axis nations. 
But we'll start with Britain. Uh, the British, like all the other nations, formed a ministry of information. They were in charge of propaganda. They had one during World War I. It went away. They recreated it for World War II. And it was all to encourage people to support the war effort. And they used the same methods everyone else did that we've talked about already. I'll keep naming all those things for you. Uh, but you see some examples, very famous examples from British propaganda. Now, they were being bombed during the blitz, you know, and uh, every day being bombed. So they had these signs around, very famous signs. If you go to England today, you're going to see these in all the souvenir shops. Uh, keep calm and carry on. This one, very famous, supporting the RAF, the Royal Air Force, because of their defense of England during this time period. And statements, uh, this famous statement made by uh, Churchill, never was so much owed by so many to so few. And now, other examples, here another common thing, the blackout. Open your door to pass it by during an air raid, they need to be sheltered. Uh, and I, I learned this at the Imperial War Museum in London a, a few years ago. Uh, some of you probably knew this, but uh, in the Imperial War Museum, they had this steel thing that looked kind of like a, a phone booth. But it was steel. It had a little door on it, and it was a bomb shelter. They had them on the corners. So if you happen to get caught on the street, you could jump in that and, and uh, try to protect yourself. Uh, you know, so there, there's a lot of propaganda here encouraging people to continue to fight. And it couldn't have been easy. I mean, think about the, the continuous bomb. Uh, other examples, uh, encouraging women uh, during the war effort. Uh, come into the factory, women uh, industrial workers. Uh, every woman not doing vital work is needed now. There was an organization called Women's Land Army doing the farming. We put most of the men who had done the farming were in the military. Uh, caring for evacuees is a national service. You know, women care for the children uh, that uh, maybe were abandoned uh, or parents were killed. Some children were sent to the countryside, uh, out of the city, out of harm's way. They needed people to care for those children. Uh, some other common things from the British, uh, you know, careless talk. Uh, BM here's, here's one I like. We do them before, we'll do them again. And then some about children. You know, we talk, I just mentioned that the children were often sent to the countryside out of harm's way during the bombings. Uh, there were posters up, leave Hitler to me, Sonny. You ought to be out of London. And here's one with Hitler whispering in the mother's ear to take them back with her, take them back. And he says, don't leave them where they are. And then children helping with the victory party. Soviet propaganda. Uh, it changed during the war. They had a propaganda body called the GLAD. And its function, like the others, was to control all of the media and the things people were seeing. But you know this, that in the beginning of the war, after the Amalkov uh, Ribbentrop uh, Pact, propaganda from the Soviet Union supported Germany and praised Germany. And, and, uh, the Soviets, the, the, the government, and Stalin, they actually had to really sell that to the Soviet people because there was no love loss there. So their propaganda was, was selling, you know, we need Germany. Germany's doing a great job. And then in 1941, that changes uh, with Operation Bar uh, Barbarossa. Uh, when Germany attacks the Soviet Union, all of a sudden, propaganda switches, and it, it attacking Germany now. Uh, and that's when they joined the Allied nations. So Soviet propaganda did switch, but you see some uh, examples of Soviet propaganda here. Napoleon was wiped out, Hitler will be too. Uh, don't talk, again, common theme. Patriotism, the motherland is called. Uh, examples of Soviet propaganda industry, you know, war industry, uh, women helping at the front line. Again, some pretty common things in Soviet propaganda. All right, I'm going to try to play this little clip for you. This is from the United States. This is a propaganda uh, piece from a, a film, a short film called Conquered uh, by the Clock from 1943. It's about war industry. Thank you. 
exactly about 10 or 11 minutes long. But you see it's supporting the, the war industry for the most part, which was uh, a vital part of the things this city did. You know, we've been a lot of cities for, uh, participated in that. And it's this film, this is a propaganda film to encourage those things. Uh, and American uh, propaganda during World War II uh, was used for the same reasons other nations, to increase support for the war effort. Uh, to get a commitment for allied victory, uh, encouraging people to do a lot of things like raise the victory garden, uh, work in the war industries, uh, uh, sell war bonds, buy war bonds, all, uh, be patriotic, join the military, any, any of the things that uh, the, all the other nations were doing. Patriotism was often a central theme uh, in the propaganda, uh, especially in the campaigns to sell war bonds. And, so, uh, oftentimes, the Axis leaders were portrayed as, as uh, uh, foolish, idiotic looking uh, in American propaganda. The United States organized the old uh, WI, Office of War Information. It was the propaganda uh, division of the government. And it was in charge of all the things like the other nations, books, pamphlets, films, and so on. One of the programs that they initiated was called Kids at War and Schools at War, uh, encouraging school kids to do their part, school age kids to do their part of the war. This poster for the Schools at War program, schools were encouraged to have scrap drives and sell war stamps. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, a kid might not be able to buy, a, say, a, a war bond. But if he might save his change, he'd be able to buy a war stamp. So they would, they would save the stamps, buy the stamps, and when they got enough stamps, then they had enough to get a war bomb. And kids did that regularly in schools. They organized scrap drives. You know, they, they did things like learning to identify enemy planes uh, and such. And then there was a program called Schools at War, where it, it was a bond drive program. Uh, to sell war stamps and war bonds enough to buy a Jeep or an airplane. And it would tell the kids, you know, this is how much you need to be able to buy a Jeep for the military. This is how much you need to raise. This is how much you need to raise to be able to buy a Piper Cub uh, for the military. Uh, but it was these were popular programs in the schools during World War II. Uh, this is from the same campaign. And then there was a program called uh, uh, a Victory Farm Volunteer. Uh, and the principal, school principal, it says senior school principal about being a farm worker to encourage the school kids to help in the form of farms. Uh, so these programs were geared toward children. This book was called The Wartime Handbook for Young Americans. And it promoted supporting the war effort. You're raising a victory garden. It also talked about buying war stamps and war bonds and, and all the things about being a patriot. And then they issued these uh, posters and, and that, that would show the diagrams of the outline of enemy planes so they could identify them. Now, sometimes things like this will scare kids. You know, if you think about that and you're telling your kids, look out for these planes, and guess what, when they go outside, what they do? So a lot of times it instilled some fear in them. Uh, but these were all programs geared toward kids during the war. Women during the war effort. This is probably the most famous World War II propaganda post. Will be the river. Um, here are some other examples. Uh, now, Rosie the Riveter represented the industrial, female industrial workers in this nation during World War II. Let me just give you a little bit of statistics here. More than six million women worked in war industries during World War II in the United States. Three million volunteered with the Red Cross during World War II. And over 350,000 served in the military during World War II in different jobs. So uh, women's roles in the war were vital in winning the war effort. And there was propaganda promoting such. You know, she'd allow a worker, a women's ordinance worker. Uh, women in the war, we can't win without them. Volunteer for the Red Cross. You know, army nurses are needed. Here, uh, women in the military. Now, this isn't uh, necessarily propaganda, but I threw this in because uh, 
I was looking at some of this stuff and, and I found that uh, Gertrude LaValle, who was a WASP pilot, the women there, sort of like uh, Donna did a program about them recently, but uh, her quote I like because we go to P-47s here. She said, the P-47 with my baby, uh, it was just so easy to fly, it was funny. Uh, race was an issue in the United States before and during World War II. Um, so the government knew that, and they knew that it was necessary to, to uh, encourage everybody to work together during the war effort. Uh, you know, even though there was segregation in most of the United States at that time, uh, overwhelmingly, African-Americans participated in the war effort, in war industry and in the military. And they kind of had double posts. <coughs> One, they wanted to defeat the Axis because they were Americans. But two, their hopes were that after victory, they would be given the same rights and freedoms as everyone else in this country. They called it the double B campaign, double victory. Uh, but the government was aware, so they created propaganda as such. Nine we win. Uh, this is a, a political cartoon by Dr. Seuss. And it says, uh, if you want to get harmony, use the black keys as well as the whites. And then this one says, twice a patriot. Uh, Obi Bartlett lost an arm at Pearl Harbor. <laughs> came home and worked in the shipyard during the war. Uh, this is a poster uh, that promoted the double victory campaign. Uh, the government didn't actually issue these, but they were issued by other organizations and African-American organizations to promote that uh, belief. Uh, buy war bonds. This is a movie poster called The Negro Soldier, and it was about Joe Lewis who served in the military during World War II. These cartoons, the government uh, actually uh, hired Charles Austin, the cartoonist, to create these and then send them to uh, African-American newspapers around the country to promote the war effort. Uh, and not all race issues were uh, related to African-Americans during the war. Japanese uh, race issues also existed. You know, we were attacked by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. But we also had a number of Japanese Americans living in our country, especially in, in the West, on the West Coast. Uh, so this was not uncommon to see things like this. There are a number of variations of, of the uh, Jack Honey license. Uh, this is, again, another uh, Dr. Seuss cartoon but you see the Japanese people lined up picking up TNT, and a guy looking out says, we're waiting for the signal home. So, you know, it's kind of a, a racist, uh, um, anta antagonistic cartoon that is uh, toward Japanese Americans. And of course, you all know that many, many Japanese Americans were totally in camps uh, during the war. So, uh, you know, it, it, was a, a, it was a delicate issue at that time because we had been attacked by the Japanese. But, uh, not one of our proudest moments as a nation of things we did in that respect. Um, we used a lot of different areas of propaganda, like we talked about before. Uh, you know, it's a real war job, all you can do. This was always one of my favorite places to have this hanging up in my classroom. Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. Uh, careless talk kills. Loose talk, you know, again, uh, uh, encouraging people to not spread rumors and or tell things. Uh, saving waste paper. Uh, fighting for our freedoms. You know, here you see a Nazi group crushing a church, you know, or, or religious freedom. Uh, some guilt geared toward children here, uh, you know, like uh, save your child, your child, you don't want him wearing this Nazi hat. Uh, here you see that uh, three uh, Axis leaders and then there's a whole bunch of things we can't, I'm not going to read all that to you, but uh, don't be fooled, this is what Hitler wants you to believe. The uh, um, 
Hollywood got pretty heavily involved in the war effort during World War II. And the Hollywood canteen uh, was started by Betty Davis and John Garfield. And it was open uh, from 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock uh, on Sunday and from 7 o'clock until midnight the rest of the week. And it was manned many times by uh, Hollywood stars and celebrities. They would come in and serve the meals and things like that. Uh, they served more than 4 million soldiers from that canteen during World War II. Uh, and it was one of the few canteens in the U.S. that was integrated. Now, Evansville can be proud of this because the canteen we had here that served over 1.6 million meals soldiers during the war also was one of the few that was integrated during the war. Um, celebrities also were involved in USO tours and uh, bond drive tours. They would go from city to city. There, there are a number of examples of, of celebrities coming through Evansville during the war and, and uh, encouraging people to buy war bonds and things like that. A lot of different items were used as propaganda. You know, here's some matchbooks that were used. Toys, playing cards, scarves, uh, pennants, uh, license plates, uh, a lot of different things here that just uh, an ashtray, you know, that were used as propaganda. Stephanie, where is your hand, Stephanie? Over in the corner. These are things from her personal collection. She had a display in here during our anniversary weekend of, of a lot of her things. So I took pictures of them because they fit right in with uh, what we're talking about today. These are children's clothing, you know, uh, copies of military uniforms. Toys, dolls, and paper dolls, and, and games, and pens. Uh, compacts, uh, makeup compacts. This is a bouquet made up of war stamps. Victory materials, these are from uh, feed sacks. In those days, feed sacks were uh, put in, our feed sacks were made of printed materials, and people would buy them and, and make clothing from them. So these are some that supported the war effort, the be for victory. And then these are, are work, the things that supported uh, the, the war industry. You know, the gloves, work for victory, a banner you can hang in your home letting people know that I serve in the U.S. war industry. Uh, so again, propaganda that came in all different forms and methods. Magazines were commonly used in propaganda. Here's a couple of examples, and you might be familiar with this one. Uh, this magazine is here in our museum uh, in the uh, home front gallery. It's from May of 1942 because there's an article in it called On the Home Front. And that article is talking about how people coped with life during, it was coping with life during the war, but it was about the Winterhall family, a family from right here in Evansville, Indiana. Related? Okay. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, that, that was a kind of propaganda because it's, it's encouraging people to do all the things, you know, and this is what everybody's dealing with. It's not just you. Uh, everybody in the country dealing with these things. And here's a Life magazine where they're encouraging uh, women to become nurses. Nurses are needed. Other advertisement. Sometimes advertisement uh, like these were used to promote their product uh, that were selling to consumers at the time. Schlitz beer. It says every fourth bottle goes overseas. So kind of a patriotic thing. Here you see all the soldiers drinking Coca-Cola. But not all of the war industries were selling to consumers at the time, like the auto industry. But they still advertised. Here's a couple of examples relating to Evansville. Republic Aviation, it says Evansville, Indiana, right there. Promoting uh, the effectiveness and the use of the P-47 fighter plane during World War II. And that's an ad from a magazine. This one says, brother, I'm a one-man army. It's about a paratrooper jumping in, uh, jumping and going in to fight. And he's using a weapon that is using ammunition made here in Evansville, Indiana at the Chrysler Ordnance Plant, the 45 caliber ammunition that was made here. So not all advertising was done necessarily to promote a product that you could buy, but it was letting you know our industry is supporting the war effort. Uh, leaflets were used. This is a copy of a leaflet. It's called the LeMay bombing, and it was dropped on August 1st, 1945. 
and it was dropped on uh, cities, 33 Japanese cities, and it basically on the back told them, within a few days, there's going to be a bombing in Japan, and many people are going to die. It's a warning to get out of the city because of these cities are targets because they're industrial military city. Uh, and shortly after that, the first atomic bomb was dropped. So I don't know, it's kind of a justification maybe by what we warned them, the drop of leaf was on. Uh, but that's one of the things we did as propaganda. Radio was probably the cheapest and most common uh, way people got their information during World War II. Most people had a radio or you had access to a radio. So well, that's how people heard things. And, and the news reporters of those days became like the most trusted guy, Edward R. Murrow and, and uh, Walter Winchell. Uh, just a real short clip here of Walter Winchell.